This bill was in a Judiciary Committee hearing before it went to the floor. And once again, Romano was in that hearing making trouble. And the Senator Patricia Rutger did something so great. She waited patiently. She let Romano, she let all the haters make their claims about what a term limits convention might do. But then she calmly explained what a convention will do, and that is propose an amendment to the Constitution for term limits. And of course, Senator Rucker, she didn't work alone. She had a secret weapon, if you will, which she brought into the debate. I'm surprised they still let you into a government building with one of these, but she brought the U.S. Constitution. And all she did was read the Constitution. She read Article 5, where it tells you how you get a convention. Article 5 says Congress shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Shall call. That means they have no choice in the matter. Which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. And that's upon application for a convention by two-thirds of the several states. So in order to get a convention, two-thirds of state legislatures, those folks who dwell in your state capital, wherever you may be, whether you're in Florida, it's Tallahassee, if you're in Connecticut, it's Hartford, if you're in California, it's Sacramento, if you're in Texas, it's Austin. Those politicians in your state capital, they have to vote for term limits on Congress. And when 34 states have done that, then we can get the term limits convention, the convention meets, it deliberates, they decide what's the right term limit for Congress, and then it goes back to the state capitals where it needs to get ratified by 38 states. And at that point, we're talking term limits for Congress. State legislators dream of being in Congress. They can't get there because they're blocked by incumbents, so they're going to have an extra powerful incentive to vote for this. It's going to be a meal ticket for them. We get comments on our Facebook page. We get comments about this on our YouTube postings of the podcast. And it's, well, Congress is never going to vote for term limits on itself. They don't have to. They don't have to. That's the beauty of what we're doing here. We don't need the politicians in Washington to vote for this. And in fact, when we use the convention, they can't stop it either. Not a single swamp creature in Washington, D.C., can stop us. That's the beauty of this. State legislators hold the power, and they hold the power for a reason. It's because the framers of our Constitution, they knew that the states had to be that final check and balance on the power of Washington, D.C. That's why James Madison said when he was introducing the Bill of Rights that the state legislatures are the sure guardians of the people's liberty that the state legislatures, like Randy Smith noted in his poignant testimony, that they are the last resort. When Washington fails to act, we always have the states, and it was done for a reason. Go back to 1787, summer of 1787, when the framers were debating how the Constitution could be amended. They were going to give Congress all of the power, but then a few different people stepped up. Most people think James Madison was behind this, but some evidence that's been unearthed by our own Ken Quinn suggests that it was really Charles Pinckney had this idea of giving states some power, giving the states say in the matter so that Congress does not have a monopoly over amendments. And thus, the Article 5 Convention was born. And it's a way of amending the Constitution. It's a way of proposing amendments to the Constitution we have. It doesn't create a new Constitution. It's like George Washington said, if the people decide that the distribution of power in America is wrong, let them change it by an amendment. Let it not be changed by usurpation. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. The distribution of power in this country is wrong. There's too much power in Washington, D.C. There's too much power in the hands of politicians who use it for their own benefit, not to benefit the people, not to create a stronger America. And that's what we want to do. We want to take power away from Washington and transfer it back to the people. You know, um, the government power, power is like air in a tire. It's like a gas. It's going to expand to fill the space that it's given. And government power, congressional power, will expand until it's checked. If you leave it unchecked, the power of politicians will expand limitlessly. So we need to put a check on power. That's exactly what the state of West Virginia is doing. And it's just fantastic. 
Kudos to Patricia Rucker for bringing the Constitution into the debate, for reading it, for schooling her colleagues who obviously have not read it in a while or maybe have never read it in the case of Senator Romano. But she said something else that was very powerful. The founders put this in the Constitution for a reason. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew the folks in Washington, D.C. would eventually abuse their power and that we needed an escape hatch. We needed a safety valve. That's what we have. West Virginia took a vote. I'm fed up, but I see that there is some hope for change on the horizon. Also in this debate, there was a great moment where uh, Senator Rucker schooled Senator Romano on the difference between Article 5 convention and a state convention because he, he didn't know the difference. You know, a state convention is how you ratify the amendment, how you confirm the amendment at the end. The Article 5 convention is how you propose the amendment. Now, I realize I'm nerding out a lot here, nerding out a little too much. I might as well be discussing Battlestar Galactica action figures with you guys. But let me summarize. The anti-term limit chump got schooled, and in the West Virginia Senate, the good guys won. So let's keep the momentum going. Let's get the West Virginia House next week. Hi, this is Scott Tillman, the National Field Director with U.S. Term Limits. I'm also part of a volunteer group in Michigan that defends our state term limits from overambitious legislators and greedy lobbyists. The Michigan group is called Don't Touch Our Term Limits. Michigan has the strongest term limits in the nation. Politicians are limited to three House terms and two Senate terms, and these are lifetime limits. Michigan's term limits are currently under attack from lobbyists and legislators. They want more time in Lansing. Voters don't want to give them any more time. October polling showed that 69% of Michigan voters oppose changing Michigan's term limits. This week, we took a giant pig on a trailer to over 30 cities in southeast Michigan. The pig is a great visual to show how politicians want more time at the trough. The response to the pig has been great. Please go to our Save Michigan Term Limits Facebook page to see locations and share stories about the pig. If you're in Michigan, please go to termlimits.com forward slash pig and take action. If you're interested in joining one of our many volunteer groups to help advocate for term limits, please contact us at termlimits.com. Florida school board term limits are back. After being derailed last session, House Representative Anthony Sabatini has reintroduced H.J.R. 157, which will put the question on the November 2020 ballot. Here, Representative Sabatini makes his case before the House Pre-K-12 Innovation Subcommittee last week. After public comment and debate, the committee approved the bill, its first step on the road to the voters. Next on our list is HJR 157 by Rep Sabatini. Limitations on terms of office for members of a district school board. Thank you so much, Chairman. Much appreciated and good afternoon, committee members. Um, House Joint Resolution 157. Might look familiar. I had it uh, before this distinguished body last year. I had a, a two hour uh, introduction scheduled, but because we heard it last year, I figured I'd narrow it down to just the point since you all have amazing memories and you remember the great arguments we made in favor of term limits last year. Um, so this is a constitutional amendment. Uh, this is not a bill uh, to enact term limits. This is a bill to give Floridians the opportunity, if they wish, this November to vote for term limits. There is no more bipartisan bill filed this year or arguably any other year uh, in the history of the legislature. Over 82 percent of Floridians in every demographic, every political category, in every piece of our state, every county have been polled. And like I said, well over three quarters of Floridians are in favor of term limits. And I'll tell you exactly why. You can look around this room and see it right now. Term limits creates a more diverse, fresh group of people who are looking at problems in new ways. You know, there's a lot of great arguments, but I do like to use an anecdote. Uh, I'm a member of the Florida Army National Guard, and anyone in the military, military veteran will tell you, one of the most foundational principles of leadership in the military is the rotation of leadership. As you succeed and, and achieve in the military, they actually move you to different organizations, different places. And I think the same principle can really be transferred to politics. If you're really good and you're a public servant and the people know that, even in the community in which you're elected, they want to move you to another position. They want to move you around and have that applied to a new political problem. And I think that's why term limits are so appealing and really transcends politics itself. The other thing I'd like to say about term limits is sometimes you hear these counting arguments of, well, if people want to choose and someone wants to serve, why are we going to limit them? We're not limiting them. 
what we're limiting is actually consecutive elections, right? So you serve eight years, two four-year terms, take a break, do something else, and then come back to the office in which you love if you want in the future. I'm totally fine with that. And the reason we're doing this, the reason the consecutive part is so important, is because it creates more competitive elections. We're living in a time where elections are getting increasingly less competitive, and people don't even know what they're voting for. They often check a box. And what happens is when you freshen it up and new people are coming in with new ideas, it forces uh, folks to pay attention, right? They're not just voting for that familiar name. They're looking and they're analyzing, they're comparing, they're contrasting new leaders in that political office. And so creating competitive elections, I think, is something that really serves democracy well. And I think I'll reserve my comments for later. That is the bill, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any question? There are no amendments. Any question, members? Um, Rep. Sabatini, um why just the constitutional officer of school boards? Why not all of the constitutional officers, such as your city clerks, those constitutional positions? That's an excellent question. I really appreciate it. And, there, and there's two things I'll say about that. One is, arguably, after the president, the governor, the cabinet, the state senate, the state house, all of these very important offices that control enormous power in our nation and state, uh, being term limited, the next, in my opinion, most arguably important and powerful position that's not term limited is our school boards. A lot of people don't realize this. The school boards actually control over $20 billion mandated for education in our state, well more than any other officer. $20 billion in the state of Florida, um, a quarter of our state budget, is administered and executed by that body. So I think it's very important in such a powerful position that we have new people rotating through. And then secondly, I'd like to say that I actually personally believe that everyone should be term limited. I think it's better to have narrowly tailored bills that focus on one or two things, and it really tailors the conversation to that, that item and doesn't get distracting. And then, you know, in the future, if somebody wants to file a bill on that, they can. So I hope that answers your question. Finally, I have a mini update for you from our friends in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. If you recall, we had a great interview with Tim Burns last week coming off the heels of a circuit court decision out of Cook County, which struck down an Illinois law as unconstitutional, a law that tried to stop localities from passing retroactive term limits on their elected officials. That was struck down in county court. But Elk Grove is another case where politicians are trembling in fear at the thought of voters making a decision. So they're doing all they can to disenfranchise them. The Elk Grove Village clerk, Lori Murphy, is still refusing to certify the question for the ballot that would let the people vote on term limits. And I'm confused because this appears to be defying a court order. Judge Maureen Hannon, circuit court judge in Cook County, just last week ordered the clerk to certify the question on term limits. So in news that probably surprises absolutely no one, an Illinois public official is refusing to follow the law. I guess in Elk Grove, there's the law, and then there's Murphy's Law, the law that only exists in the mind of a delusional village employee who despises term limits. And by the way, you know, there's a time for civil disobedience, Rosa Parks, Gandhi, etc. But trying to block a lawfully organized petition drive is just a vile and rotten thing to do. And with this behavior, I would say the elected officials in Elk Grove are only proving why term limits are needed so badly. Maybe if you didn't act like this, the citizens wouldn't be clamoring for term limits. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? It's a little bit of a catch-22. And on top of that, the city is now using the top lawyer for Michael Madigan, 35-year Speaker of Illinois, to get this overturned. And they have the top lawyer for the Republican Party working to get it overturned as well. <laughs> Can't make this up. The political duopoly has descended on a village of 33,000 people to tell the citizens what to do. And if you remember, at the very outset of this case, the arguments they were making, the arguments the city was making against Tim Burns was that he is an outsider. And term limits is coming from outside. The people of Elk Grove don't want this. Well, now we know the facts that the people of Elk Grove want it. And the outsiders are the lawyers, the high powered sharks the city is bringing in to fight the people and to overturn the people's will. So we're tracking this story. 
And uh, we hope for the best. We hope that citizens actually do get to vote on March 17th. Look, some people fear spiders. Other people fear closed-in spaces. The mayor of Elk Grove Village fears voters. He fears what will happen to his political career if the people can walk into that ballot box on March 17th and pass term limits. Keep following for updates on this story. Thanks for joining us for this episode of No Uncertain Terms. Term limits are an American tradition that is worth celebrating. On February 27th, how will you publicly show your support for Term Limits Day? For ideas, go to termlimits.com forward slash term limits day. For swag, go to termlimits.com forward slash shop. Feel free to contact us with your ideas through our website as well. Whatever you do, be sure to document it on social media. Thanks. We'll be back next week. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe and leave a review. The No Uncertain Terms podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and now Google Play. U-S-T-L Honestly, we've got a school board member in Florida who has been in office since 1976. I checked. The top song that year was Play That Funky Music, White Boy. I'm not even sure if you could still say that anymore.